So today, guys, I'm just going to tell you a few stories and then I'm going to go. Is that cool? All right. Good. I want to talk about experiences. I want to talk about gaining experiences and how things happen when you get out and you do interesting stuff or you do, you get out and you actually just start something about how um, things start to happen for you in unexpected ways and how it's usually good, but it's, it's never bad. And so I feel like the best way to illustrate that is just to tell you a couple of stories. And, um, and so I want to, I'm going to start with a story of how I met somebody named Stammy. Uh, S-T-A-M-M-I-E. Stammy's one of the most special people I've ever met. This was when I was living in Hawaii in a town called Laie, which was kind of a two-tier society. Uh, it's on the North Shore of Oahu, and it's a hard place to live for many of the native Hawaiians because rich people basically from the mainland come, they buy the property, and they drive the prices up like a lot of spots like that. And so there's a huge problem, or there was a huge problem with alcoholism and stuff like that amongst the youth of Laik. And so the Pacific Islander population, um, also, just so you know, they're, they're like the massive humans. Like these Pacific Islanders are massive humans. Their football team is crazy dominant. This all goes back to Stammy. Um, the Kahaku Red Riders uh, very often have perfect seasons, like I think it was two years ago they had a 10 and 0 season they won the state championships and so football and weight training in this tiny like hawaiian uh, little little community are the only real outlet and stammy's house is at the center of it so let me paint you a picture of this his house is down this down the street basically around the corner with two giant dogs in kennels at the front of it and you start to walk up. I remember they were pit bulls, but I could be wrong. But they were just like two giant, like basically attack dogs. And they're on chains. So they're outdoor, but they're on chains. And they're on either side of the driveway and you have to walk past them to get in. I'm, I was told that they were gentle. Um, but I'm pretty sure that if Stammy told them to attack, they would have torn my limbs off. And so Stammy, the guy whose house that I stayed at when I was living there for three months, knew of Stammy and knew that I was looking for a place to lift weights and there's no gym. So Laie, for those who have never heard of it, is also a huge Mormon community. There's one of the biggest Mormon temples actually in the world in Laie. And there's a Brigham Young campus, which is the Mormon university as well. And so Laie doesn't, there's no bars, there's no coffee shops, there's nothing like that. There's no Coca-Cola in the grocery stores. Like it's, it's, it's Mormon through and through. And there were also no gyms. There's probably a gym in the campus, like Mormons work out. There was probably a gym in the campus, but there were no gyms anywhere else. So the guy's house that I stayed in told me about Stammy. And so he walked me to Stammy's place. Stammy says, hi, shakes my hand with this massive like oven mitt of a hand. And he walked me around back uh, to his place past those dogs and under a tarp. And I see this like rusted weight set up in his backyard. He got the old equipment from the school and set it up behind his house. And he let any neighborhood kid come train in the hopes that they wouldn't get into drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. So I went home from Stammy's that day and I emailed uh, a friend of mine and, and a great trainer. His name's Dan Trink. He goes by Trink Fitness. And I told him that I had read an article of his on T Nation that was an own specific workout. And I wanted to try turning it into an online fitness product and that I'd be the test subject. And so that's what we did. I took a single article that he wrote on T Nation into an ebook. He owned the text of the article, right? So I just re-edited it slightly. I got it designed by an outsource person, designer person into a PDF. And I took the workout that was in the article and I just got them put on like custom like workout PDF forms um, into custom made workout shirts. And we called it Two Tickets to the Gun Show. And I wrote the sales page <laughs> copy. <laughs> and then I, it, we had all these funny, like, like, welcome to the arm again. And like all these like corny. <laughs> uh, but then I trained did. my ass off at Stammy's. I was the test subject for this workout. So I trained my ass off on the program. I took pictures before and after I got amazing results. I showcased them on social media and we sold hundreds of this thing on day one because I demonstrated the whole process through. There were a couple lessons to this that I want to share. Um, 
The first is that changing the medium of a thing can often change its value. This was an article on T-Nation that was already on the net because we changed the medium of the thing and made it into a, a packaged workout. It changed the value of it. It went from a free article to something that we actually sold, right? And so you don't actually need to do something new often. You just need to figure out how to change whatever you're doing. The second was that a product doesn't have to be pretty. It just needs to have results that get showcased. Don't get so wrapped up in trying to make your thing the best looking thing ever. It actually doesn't matter that much. Definitely not at the beginning. What matters is that there's an outcome that you can prove and demonstrate. And if you have to be that outcome, you put blinders on and you work your ass off and you become that outcome. And the third is that if you want to make something happen, like you want to learn how to call it market online, you can try to market your own thing or you can just go out and find somebody else's thing and offer to market it for them. And most people would be pretty happy. Uh, there were there were three instances. I basically taught myself internet marketing by internet marketing other people's things in the early days. And so the first one was was with Dan. I did it with somebody named Kathleen Heffernan, who had a product called the Bikini Model Cookbook. This is in like 2012. And I was introduced to her through my web designer. And she had all these recipes and stuff like that. And she was a bikini model, obviously. And I went to Calgary, um, was, was there like monitoring the filming, spent two days with her and then took the whole thing and literally built, took her recipes. And it was the same thing, took everything, turned it into an ebook, built the sales page, built the funnel stuff. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but it's way better to do that for somebody else than to do it for yourself. And they were ecstatic. And then I did it for free, but I got a percentage of the sales and the craziest shit is but this was like 2011, probably. She still sells that ebook to this day. And at one point, three or four years out, she just bought me out because uh, she just didn't want to pay me every more month after month after month. But and then and then the third instance where I did this was I'm pretty sure it's OK for me to tell the story. I don't know why it wouldn't be. But uh, Girls Gone Strong. So GGS, Molly Galbus, amazing company. I was a silent eighth member when that first started. And so when Girls Gone Strong started, it wasn't just Molly. It was actually seven amazing women that came together and did it. And it, now Molly is the one who runs it and the other six aren't involved. But I was actually the eighth member of it. Um, and I was the only guy, obviously. And so I built, um, I built the entire initial lead generation flow, email flow and stuff like that for Girls Gone Strong when they started. And then... Um, I decided that trying to work with seven incredible forward thinking, industrious women, uh, who all have equal says in their business, uh, was just something that I didn't want to partake in. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't to remember my life. exactly how it happened. Yes. Yeah. I don't remember exactly how it happened. Either I stepped away or they told me to step away or it was some combination <laughs> of the two of them. Uh, but, uh, I mean, obviously Molly and I have, have stayed good friends, right? But if you're trying to do something, if you're trying to learn something, the best way to learn it is just to fucking do it and figure it out as you go. There's only so many books you can read. There's only so many podcasts you can listen to. It is much better to actually go out and do the thing. And so you don't need to do the thing for your own thing. You can go out and find somebody else's. So continuing on with the story on the North Shore of Oahu, right? So remembering back this story, the training, the story with Dan Trink, um, finding Stammy, it, it really got me through the loneliness of the North Shore when I was living there because I lived there for three months, isolated. I didn't know any other human. I was separated from Allison at the time. And, and it was a time of real, like, isolation, self-discovery. Uh, and then I moved to Maui. And I moved to Maui to, like, build myself back up after those three months. So, so those three months in North Shore were, like, difficult. Um, and then in Maui, I found another room in a house off Craigslist, this time in East Kanapali. 
And I emailed Dan again and I told him that I had three months and I wanted to do a photo shoot. I said, I have, I have a number of rules for living that I want to do at some point. Uh, one of those rules is I want to get shredded, take pictures and never fucking do it again. <laughs> and now is a good time to do it. So the next three months were grueling. Um, my nutrition and training got dialed in. And so in Hawaii, for those who don't know, I actually really like it. In Hawaii, all shoreline is public access. So even like the fanciest uh, resorts and stuff like that, that are on the beach, they have to have public access and public parking and, and, and a way for people to get down to the water, which is great. So I do my morning fasted walks along the ocean on the paths, like right outside, like thousand dollar a night hotels. Right. And then depending on the day, one or two workouts uh, in a well, I had a bike. So I just like go up the hill to this gym. And my life revolved around training for three months. Like it was all training nutrition, right? There was no family. There was no social life. It was eat, sleep, train, eat, sleep, train. Any work that I did was slotted around those training sessions. I was single. I was by myself and I was on an island in the middle of the ocean. Training multiple times a day, eating rigidly was fine. It wasn't enjoyable, but it was fine. It was something that I could do. But what I realized is that I started to dread my workouts and I didn't look forward to my days. I committed to doing the damn thing. So I found a local photographer in Maui. We booked a photo shoot. I gave Dan the date and I kept going for those two months. But what that experience taught me was that what people don't tell you about pics of shredded bodies is not just the extreme training and commitment and the sacrifice, but also the extreme 24 hours before the pictures are taken to manipulate the body before a photo shoot actually happens because the crazy shit comes the final week before. So Dan had me carb cycling. So for a few weeks prior, basically I was cycling my carb intake, slowly decreasing the amount of carbs that I have. And, and the idea was, was to systematically deplete my carb stores so that by the final week, I wasn't eating carbs of any kind. And then at the same time, I was ramping up my water intake. And then two days before the shoot, I drank so much water, I kid you not, I felt like I was drowning. Anybody who's done this will attest, it is the weirdest feeling. I felt like I was drowning. It was... God, I wish I could remember the amount, but it was gallons upon gallons of water. It was, I would drink till I would physically be ill. And then I was zero carbs at that point. But two days before, I think it was the day before, my instructions would eat as much sugar as humanly possible mm -hmm. to be able to, to basically like increase the glycogen stores and make the, make the muscles show up. And so I first ate pancakes doused with syrup followed by coconut cream pie. And then I stood up and I fell over because I was so dizzy. The water, so the way that the water works is that when you deplete your body of water, or sorry, when you, when you drink a ton of water, basically your body makes you piss, but there's like a 24 hour delay I don't know the specifics of it, but there's like a 24 hour delay. And so I loaded up and I loaded up and I loaded up and I basically taught my body that this is how much water I'm taking in. And then what happened was I stopped drinking water. So the day before the shoot, I drank no water, but my body was expelling water as if I was still drinking that amount. The night before the photos, I lost 12 pounds <laughs> of weight in piss. <laughs> That's how much, sorry, 11.4 pounds. I'll be specific because I kept track of it. The night before the photo shoot, I lost 11.4 pounds of weight in urine. And then I went and got the photos taken. And I will never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I talk about getting shredded in my content. And I talk about how it ain't all that. I talk about how there's more to it. And the only reason that I feel like I can justifiably talk about it is because I did the thing. And the only reason I think that when I talk about it, people connect with it. And I see other people talking about it, some that other folks connect with it, some that they don't, 
you can tell if somebody's actually done a thing or hasn't done a thing. I think there's only so many books, so many podcasts that you can listen to. I think when you actually go out there and you experience what it's like for yourself, you can decide then whether it's right for you or not right for other people. When I talk about getting shredded, I don't talk about it and say, nobody should ever do this. All I say is, yo, there's more to the story. Let me tell you about that. And I wish more people understood what goes into those shredded physiques. I could do it at the time because I was single. I was by myself. I had no social commitments. I was living on an island with all the time in the world. And even then, the week leading up to those photos were so extreme and unhealthy. It is frightening. That's the story about being shredded. It's a good Let's story, talk about John. those stories a little bit first. And then I want to talk to you about how my friend met his wife. You ever done anything like that, Ren? Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did a men's physique competition in 2012, which was two years before I became a coach. And I did it as something to distract me. I lost my sister one year prior, almost one year exactly. So October, October 29th, 2011, my sister gets in a car accident, dies suddenly. And then October, maybe 5th or 6th, 2012, I'm in a men's physique show, uh, you know, f state thing. And uh, it's ironic that you said that because the first thing I remember getting on the stage was uh, a, a bikini competitor passed out, right? And I was... You know, okay. and I wasn't certified at this point, but I've been a I've been a deep wellness enthusiast for a large part of my life, like from 15 right. on. And I'm 38 ish, something like that. At this point, I'm in a master's uh, and um, man, I was hungry. <laughs> and I remember getting on stage and being sort of excited, nervous, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember being on stage thinking I will never, ever, 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 <laughs> ever. Ever, ever. I was I was like Chris Tucker, the guy from uh, uh, Rush Hour with Jackie Tan. I was yeah. like, man, I will never, ever, 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 ever do this shit again. I promise you. And and I have not done it since, man, because like you said, Sean, like people's, first of all, uh, just two more things and then, then I'll yield because I know you got stuff you want to say. And Amber's probably got some. Um, two things. Number one. When people see a couple that looks like that on the internet, I know that they think, oh, that's a super sexy couple. Oh, I, I bet they're getting after it all the time. Let me guarantee you, those people haven't had sex in months, nor do they care. Their sexual and function their farts, is so disregulated. Their farts are probably disgusting. Farts are awful. Their farts they're are pissed off God. all the time, right? They're carb depleted, <laughs> hungry. Sexual function has been run into the ground. Nobody's getting any anything. And the second thing that people think is, oh, look how healthy they are. Man, that's health goal, body goals, health goals. That's a healthy. Those two people couldn't run to the next corner without right. passing the fuck out and falling down. That is the least right. healthy state that a human can ever be in. And if you've ever done it, you know it's far from anything that's close to health. It's awful. It's literally the only thing you but get you out of that. you got to kind of do it. Right? You got to do, do, do it to know that. Like if you like, I mean, you don't need to do it. But if you're in this industry and you're curious about it, you, to me, I think it's I think it's valuable to. I think it's very valuable to to at least try the thing and see what it feels like. You may not go all the way with it, right? Um, or you might because you might enjoy it because some people really do love it, and I think that that's cool. I think that that's for them. You know, whenever I share content or information or, or opinions about anything, it's very rarely <laughs> with the – it's very rarely in the way of just like this is wrong. Like you shouldn't do this. It's more just like, you know, from my experience, I think that there's more to this story. And here's what that is. Uh, you can take that how you will um, and then go do it. I mean whether or not those two people are having sex or have stinky – Stinky folks, I don't know, but uh. <laughs> hey, you know. Also, John, I work from a hot stove theory, right? And I think I've shared this on the podcast before. I don't know if I have or I haven't. Have I shared no, my hot stove theory? I don't think so. But Amber, we're talking Amber about folks, and I hope that it's not well, related. 
you, know, you you guys both have kids, so you probably know this better than anybody, but you can't explain to a toddler that the stove is hot, right? They have no okay. concept of what that means. They, they've right. never engaged with it. Like, they've never felt it before. So you saying, don't touch that stove. It's hot. Mm. Stay away from it. It, it doesn't mean anything to them. In the same way, when I'm trying to caution maybe my clients, say, hey, you don't want to be shredded. Like, you don't want to go down that road. You know, a fitness competition probably isn't the gateway out of disordered behavior. But but if the toddlers never touch the stove, John, they got no concept. So they you got to yeah. let them touch it. So my perspective is, hey, I'll support you in any way you want to do 75 hard. OK, I'm happy to support you in any way. How can I be supportive to you? Because when the toddler touches that stove, you'll never have to have that conversation again. Every time they walk through the kitchen, they're going to look at that stove. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, hot, hot. And you're going to say, yes, yes, sweetie, hot. And they're going to go by that stove. Hot, hot. They'll do it like for days in a row. Because they, because you have, some people have, like you said, you have, having the experience allows you a better understanding of how hot the fucking stove is. <laughs> so yeah. you know, I touched it once, and I'm I'm 2012. I'm good. Like never again for me. That's I my story. A, I have a friend. I have a friend. His name is also named John. And I'm not just saying this to celebrate that I have a friend. Um, I, but I thought that's what it was. That. But I have a friend. His name is also John. And John was like pretty reserved and shy. I mean, so was I. So were a lot of people when they're young. But he was pretty reserved and shy. And, um, and you know, he had some girlfriends and stuff like that. But uh, he, he wanted somebody to get serious with. And he was having trouble finding them. But he was, like, staying at home. He was working. He was, you know, out of college and you know, master's degree. And he was out of college and newly working and busy and tired and whatever it is. And then one day, I don't know when he decided to make this, but one day he said to me, he's like, he's like, for the next month, I'm going to say yes to everything. Mm, mm-hmm. And I don't know what spurred that on. I don't know where that came about or how that came about. But he said, for the next month, I'm going to say yes to everything. Anytime anybody asks me to go anywhere or do anything, I'm just going to say yes. How long do you think it took for him to meet his wife? Less than the 30 days. <laughs> It was about two and a half weeks. <laughs> and we were, we were all out together. I remember we were at a vodka bar. This is how long it was. I was at a vodka bar. You know when the last time I was at a vodka bar? Probably this night. Uh, so we were, at a, we were at a vodka bar. I think it was called Proof Vodka Bar. And it was like 11 at night. Again, you want to know the last time I was out till 11 at night? <laughs> probably this night. Um, and they've been married about 10 years. So that's, that's, that tells you something. But... But I remember we were out and, and this this girl, now woman, um, was there with some of her girlfriends, right? And her and my friend John were obviously talking. And they, they I mean, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. I was into my own thing. I, I was, my ex-girlfriend was there and I was like <laughs> trying to get with her for the night. Like that's what was happening with me that night. But I think I was successful. I don't remember. Anyway. No. But – it didn't matter but we so i wasn't paying that much attention but what i did notice was that she she left with her girlfriends she walked out and my friend chris chris jackson uh whose brother his name is michael michael jackson um which is amazing yeah sad but also (laughs) awesome but my friend chris i remember i was i was looking at him and all of a sudden john leaves and he walks out and he brings her back. And I just look at Chris and he looks at me and Chris, Chris reminds me a lot of you and in, in a lot of ways, like just like very animated, just like funny. He's just like, yo, he brought her back. He brought her back. Right? And oh my gosh, this idea. And, and now they're, and now they're married. They've been together ever since. Right. Like, like actually they've been together ever since and have two kids. All it takes, it doesn't take that much time where you just say yes to stuff and do stuff and get out there and put yourself out there in like uncomfortable ways. Like, again, this guy was shy and reserved and he's like me. He's like a short white Jewish guy. Like, like, you know, we're not, 
it's not like women are like when they grow up like oh i really would love to meet a five foot four white jewish guy like that's not like allison was pretty sure that she was going to marry a six foot black guy like like that was what she assumed growing up you know what i'm oh saying my gosh. so it's not like girls are like going out of their way to like meet guys like us <laughs> i guess is what i'm getting at and uh-huh. and so he was shy and and clearly like was not comfortable doing this but he said yes to go out and then he went and brought her back like was like yo i don't want you to leave i'm really enjoying spending time with you and that couldn't have been easy it does not take that much time to act this way to make real legitimately significant change happen Mm -hmm. in your life you don't need to put yourself out there for that long you don't need to uh, just aggressively try things that many times i did what did i say at the beginning of it i did three of these projects right for other folks before i started really delving into my own i marketed three programs for other people and that taught me enough to say, okay, I, 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 I get how this works. I saw all the data. I saw the behind the scenes. I know what works. I know what doesn't work now based off of this, like admittedly small subsection, but enough for me to say, okay, this is how I'm going to attack this kind of market for myself. And here are the steps at three times. It's not that many. It didn't take very long. This guy said yes to every invite for like two and a half, three weeks. <laughs> and met his wife. Married. <laughs> well, it, it took him a little bit to get married, but he was he was my first good friend to get married. It was a rousing party at the synagogue, let me tell you. <laughs> uh it was not. It was it was late. But <laughs> turn, turn the synagogue out, huh? <laughs> yeah, we don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if we turned any type of synagogue out. Um, it was, uh, it was not, uh, yeah, it was not. Uh, the it was synagogue not is lit, yo. <laughs> his, this is a guy who the theme for his bar mitzvah was roller coasters. I remember. Oh my God. That was so long ago. He's been like a good friend of mine since I was eight. And the oh, theme awesome. for his bar mitzvah at the synagogue was was roller coasters, that's and on awesome. every table there was like a different roller coaster on the thing. <laughs> yeah, man, we were super cool. Back it's in the, the day. most wholesome John Goodman story I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, I got others. <laughs> oh, Ooh, I got others, my friend. We'll oh, save some of those. That's there awesome. Was some French, there were some French Canadian girls in the mix at times. Uh, so I said wholesome, John. Yeah, not, no, not, not I know. Not I know. Not awesome. <laughs> we'll get into this. Is I feel like this episode needs to be called "A Few Wholesome Stories," and then there's going to be another episode, "A Few Wholesome Stories." <laughs> I'm here for either one. Yeah, I mean, that's why I show up to this place. Yeah. Swap. So this, yeah. but this, so part of this idea of getting experiences and getting out there is it does not take very long when you start to get experiences yeah so you know for for our students out there listening i hope you i hope you're digging what john's dropping here man like because across the board a lot of you guys out there suffering from paralysis analysis it's it's not helping right i saw a quote last week and i don't have an attribution for the quote so i pretend like i created it uh, as i often do Uh, but the quote was the longer The longer you delay creating your future, the less time you get to live in it, right? And that's a great example of what John just said about his about his buddy John, right? He didn't wait to imagine if he was still doing. He did wait a long time. He He waited a long long time, time. but when he decided that, but when he decided, he had a he had a very wholesome wholesome experience. Right, right. So he he could (laughs) if he hadn't shifted, he could be in the same position today. All you know, the decade plus later. But he 100%. did something, right? He just—I I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm—I'm I'm gonna. I think that's a plot of a Jim Carrey movie too, called Yes Man. 
I'm just going to do this yes man thing and I'm just going to, you know, say yes to everything. And in two and a half weeks, man, he found his life partner. Like, that's it's yeah, a good I mean, he didn't lesson. know she was his life partner right. uh, for a while, obviously. But, uh, but as far as I know, they've been together ever since. I don't think that they ever had, you know, like Allison and I had a month break in yeah. our relationship where yeah. I needed to basically figure out how to not be an idiot. And, um, <laughs> but, but I don't think they ever had that. Are you, are you saying you have figured it out? Well, I, I figured out how, I, I mean, I figured out how special she was. Okay. For sure. right. I'm just checking. Um, I'm checking. I'm asking the questions. I think the audience wants the answers to John. That's I all. Mean, I've always kind of made it up as I went. <laughs> right. I've always kind of explored and made it up as I went, but I think I've, I think I've started to appreciate how special she was. <laughs> Very good. John. I don't know if I realized that in, in the idiocy of my youth. Yeah. I think that's fair. That's fair. I, I, you know, okay. So another aspect of this, uh, this conversation, there's two more aspects of it that I kind of thought I wanted to hit on. One is, I'm not the first person to say this, obviously, but you're the sum total of your experiences. You don't know what your experiences will turn into. And as you gather experiences and history and you and you go out there and do things, and I'll tell you an example, you don't necessarily know how you're going to benefit or not benefit from them. And I actually think there's a lot of value in that. I think that things you do where you feel like there's going to be a direct benefit are actually, it's one kind of measure of like perhaps something you maybe shouldn't do necessarily. You should be going into something saying, this is going to help me understand my world a little bit better and how I want to exist within it and provide me with a, with more of a well-rounded uh, experience to be able to show up in my own unique way. And um, uh, one of the things that I always love to do, you know, I work in fitness, right? Left to my own devices. I have always historically trained in a very similar way. Stuff that just kind of comes more naturally to me. And it might be people I met early on in my training days. I don't really know. But stuff that comes more naturally to me. Yeah, kind of like, like body parts, splits, like kind of bro training type stuff. It's just whatever. It's how I started. So anytime that I'm left to my own devices, I kind of default back to that naturally. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But I've tried to, over the years, hire trainers and hire experts and take part in programs that are just a really wide variety of things. A, to figure out what I like more, but also just to understand my world and my industry more and empathize with other people who work in fitness that may come from different backgrounds, but also just understand the body better through my own experience of how something feels. I think it would be very difficult edging on irresponsible to comment on an extreme body physique transformation if you've never undergone something like that yourself. Because you just don't know what it feels like. Right. So wherever I go, I'll usually, I mean, there, there's two things I'll do. One is if I'm in Toronto or whatever it is, I'll generally like join programs or hire trainers that are just of different things. So right now, you know, we had an episode on it. I've joined a CrossFit box. I'm about four and a half, five months into training there. Right. So like CrossFit, that's cool. I've hired online trainers while I've been in Toronto that have different modalities. And the best way to learn is by hiring an expert that you want to learn as their customer. John Barardi talks to me about this all the time is one of the best things that he ever did with his own development and how he built up PN was he would choose one person to follow every single year. And he did everything they asked him to do. He read all their emails. He clicked on all their links. He opted in for anything they opted in. He bought all of their products and books. And he, the reason why he told me this is I messaged him one day. I was like, dude, my email marketing system says you're my most engaged user. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you're my guy this year. <laughs> That's awesome. That was one of the ways that he would kind of stay relevant, but also just figure out how other people are doing things, right? Because in doing that, he would say, oh, I really loved what they did with that one email. Oh, I see what they're doing with this product. I see how this fits in. And he would just pick a different person every year and he would become their customer. So I do the same thing with trainers, right? I'll pick a different trainer. And if I want to learn about type of fitness, or if you want to learn about 
online training or if you want to learn about some sort of e-commerce thing or whatever you're doing, the best way to learn about them is to become their best customer. And that in your learn how they're doing what they're doing, you'll start to get targeted by their ads, right? You'll, you'll see the content more often. You'll see what they, what you like or don't like about their products. And then the other aspect of it for me is an element of randomness, which I think we all need a lot more of in our lives. I did this a couple of different ways, actually. There was a period, I, I, I unsubscribed to them now because I got what I needed out of them. But there was a period a couple of years ago where I just subscribed to a bunch of print magazines. And I can't remember exactly where I found them. I think I just Google searched like most interesting print magazines. And there was one from, uh, there was one from the UK that published purposefully delayed information. So it was based on this idea that the news cycle moves too fast and it self-selects for um, unsubstantiated research. And so what these guys did was they called it slow journalism. They reported on stories three months old with the, with the benefit of hindsight and told the whole story, right? But it was from the UK, so it was all like UK stories. And so I just get this magazine once every four months um, or three months, I think it was. Uh, it was called Delayed Gratification. There was another one. Dave Eggers has this like fiction story thing where he just uh, collects the best indie short stories into a magazine and sends it out, I think, once a quarter as well. So I signed up for four of these and they just arrived at my house. The most random stuff, the most random stories from around the world. I think introducing an element of randomness into your own development can be really beneficial. You'll learn things, you'll hear things that may challenge you in ways, but also just might like create connections. And I do this when I travel. Wherever I travel, I hire a coach or I join a program. And so when we were living in Greece, we lived in a little town on the island of Crete called Amudara which is if you fly into Crete, you fly into a town called Oraklion, which is like the one airport. It's in the south of Greece, right? Obviously. And um, and it's, yeah, and it's about 45 minutes uh, east from Oraklion, this town called Amudar. And I'm walking around town and there's no gym in the town. It's like a small little town. And I'm walking around town and I see in this little hotel, I see this little like studio, like, like fitness setup thing. So we walk around the back of it because we're there kind of off season. I walk around the back of it and um and there's there's this guy there that's like fashioning his hunting equipment. <laughs> what? And and I and I asked him, I was like, oh, you know, like is that like a gym in front or or whatever? He's like, oh, my brother, uh, my my bro my brother is a trainer. You know, he's Greek, so it's like English wasn't super strong. This is like a Greek tourist spot, so his English wasn't. Strong. He's like, I, uh, I I I hunt. I hunt. <laughs> I'm like, I can see that. Uh, <laughs> and then he said, people. <laughs> so we called so we called his uh, yeah people so we called his his brother to the front and his brother was like his brother was a trainer who had this little studio in the front of this hotel his brother was an endurance athlete was a cyclist and so for the two and a half months that i lived in greece in this little town i was personal trained by a greek endurance cyclist <laughs> right for 20 euros an hour. I mean, it like it costs so little, but um, I learned about endurance training right there. When I lived in Montenegro, which is if you go to Croatia, which more people know of basically south, kind of in between Montenegro is like a tiny country. It used to be Serbia and then it broke off. Um, like it used to be Serbia, Montenegro, and then it's broke off. And they mm -hmm. the language that they speak is Montenegrin which is basically Serbian. They just wanted their own language. So they just gave it a new name. <laughs> um, so when Ugh. we lived in Montenegro, it was a similar thing. We asked people around, they're like, oh, there's this gym in like the mall and it's like off of like the main area, but there's this mall and there's the one gym in town. Huh. And so we go up there and, and, you know, we speak to the guy and he spoke good yeah. enough English. And we asked him if he could train us. And so for three months, this guy was an old school Soviet barbell five by five trainer. Hmm. He went to university in Serbia. He got all his education in Serbia. So what do you think I did for three months in Montenegro? 
I trained like Soviet barbell training from some dude <laughs> <laughs> Montenegro <laughs> and became like friends with him and like hung out with like him and his family on the beach and stuff like that in um, in Mexico I went to the gym and the only trainer who was there was a boxing coach cool now I'm doing that all of these things has given me this just really great well rounded I mean I don't know like I don't know how I use or don't use these things. There isn't, there certainly isn't direct application, but it's enabled me to, I feel like, just understand my world and my approach to my world a little bit better and my place within it, and also empathize and appreciate other people do things differently. And I think that's really cool. And I mean, I can give you other examples of just like random training in Costa Rica. Um, we worked uh, Nosara Functional Fitness, I believe it was called. We're actually on the pamphlet. He did a photo shoot with us. I think we'll, <laughs> people still send me pictures when they go through town there and like, they're like, hey, I see you. Uh, so Molly was there too. So like, it's like me and Molly, like basically on this like flyer in the middle of Costa Rica. I think I'm doing dips. Molly's doing a chin up, of course, because she's badass. And uh, <laughs> but it was like it was it was tack fit training, so it was like jungle tack fit training that we did, which was with uh, he had clubs, he had all this stuff. So now we've done that. Um, it's just fun to explore this kind of stuff, <laughs> but but to add that element of randomness of just hey, whoever's there is who I'm going to train with, right? I don't do it for a few months and if i like it i'll do more of it and if i don't that's just something that i did and the same thing with education with magazines right not everything you read has to be directly applicable not everything you study not everything you learn not everybody you talk to has to directly produce some sort of short-term outcome in fact i think most of the time it probably shouldn't you're the uh you're the forrest gump of fitness jonathan just these, ran these wild <laughs> random stories, and when I was in Montenegro, <laughs> I was running. <laughs> no, I was running in Greece. I was running Which a lot in Greece, man. Whichever. <laughs> I was running this a is, lot in Greece. This is the book that I want. Like, when does this book come out? I want uh, the, the so Secret Life of John Goodman. That's the book that I want. I do actually, I mean, I'm, I I can tell you right now, I'm never going to write this book, uh, but wow. I did have, I did have a concept one time of, <laughs> of writing a book that was almost like a journalistic book about right. fitness around the world. And I was going to travel around the world and, and work out with people and just talk about the commonalities and what people do differently and stuff. I mean, in Uruguay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> in, <laughs> just oh, in the God. north of in the north of Uruguay, just before the border with Brazil, um, there's a national park called the Santa Teresa National Park, but just before that there's a town called Punta del Diablo, which is like Beach of the Devil, and, and they call it that because there's just like a bunch of like dead animals that end up on the beach all the time. We saw some really nasty dead animals there. But it's a really cool town. Um but there's no gym, there's no fitness, anything. But we found a chin up bar at one point. And um, and we asked the, the the people that was going on, and they're like, "Yeah, the lifeguard and the lifeguards and the army use that chin up bar, and that was like the workout." So like that's what I did when we lived in Uruguay. It was like I used like the lifeguards chin up bar. There was also <laughs> when we lived there, Allison for her birthday decided that she wanted to do horseback riding, which I don't know horseback riding like. Maybe I'm just like a short Jewish guy with short legs and I can't like split them wide, you know? It just is not fun. But I did it for her because I love her. And we, we get on these horses and because I'll do anything once, right? Like I jumped out of a plane, like I paraglided, like I'll do all the shit once. And and so so we get on these horses and it takes us out to this national park in Uruguay. And we're in the national park. And all of a sudden, Allison, for some reason, she still says it's not her fault. It was 100% her fault. Uh, she decides <laughs> to let her horse take her, like, off in a direction that nobody knew. 
and our guide was completely irresponsible because I don't know, it's like a Uruguayan like horse guide. Like I don't know, like it's, it's just irresponsible. <laughs> so we didn't know where Allison went. <laughs> And she's on a horse by herself. Meanwhile, my horse is getting pissed off because I didn't want to be on a horse and he probably didn't want me on him. I don't understand why horses let humans ride them. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, a horse can just fuck you up if they want to. Like, why would they let you, like, sit on them? So anyway, so my horse is, like, bucking me off. So I'm, like, thrown off my horse, right, two separate times. And it's getting pitch black in this national park. There's no lighting anywhere. This is dark. Like, like, dark. And the guide runs off on his horse to find Allison. And I'm by myself now on my horse on the path we're supposed to be on. And eventually they find Allison. But now the guide can't find his way back because it's so dark. So he calls the army. So the Uruguayan, <laughs> <laughs> so the Uruguayan army now finds us and escorts us on horseback. <laughs> back to our <laughs> back to where we were staying, which was an off the grid eco home. Oh my um, god. In what? the in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so that was that was the time I rode horses. Um Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was Uruguay. Um There's a lot of Uruguayan stories. There's a uh, I'll I'll save that one. Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm upset that there are this many stories that some have to be saved for later, later, later times. Oh my gosh. So, okay. So I don't actually know. I never looked up what the actual word is, but you know, when you're making a coffee um, and you put the grounds of the coffee into like the French press or not the French press, you know, the stove top one where it's like the metal thing and you put the coffee in and then you put it on the stove and it, and it steams and bubbles up and the steam goes, the coffee grinds. Anyway, the thing's no. called, the thing's called a percolator is the name of the, of the mechanism, right? So like mm -hmm. a coffee percolator and it's like a good way to make coffee. Okay. So apparently in Spanish, there's a word that sounds a lot like percolator that means bum sex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told. So we arrive at this eco home in Uruguay. And the sweetest couple in the world. She was Spanish. She was Chilean. They were travel journalists. And they had a baby and couldn't be travel journalists anymore and decided that they wanted to bring the world to them. And so they created this off the grid eco home in Uruguay and they bring the world to them. And that's how they satisfy this desire of getting to know the world while they have a young family. Beautiful story. Great people. So we get there and they're like the most innocent people ever. Right. So we get there and, uh, and I asked them if they had a percolator <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, what? I was like, Oh, a percolator for the morning. <laughs> like, and they, and they, they played me the song. I don't know if you've ever heard the song. It's a rap song. It's like, I know the time song for the percolator. Yeah. Time for the percolator. Yeah. Time for the percolator. And so, um, so basically I was asking this sweet Spanish and Chilean couple <laughs> if, if I could have bum sex in the morning. Um, <laughs> that's that story. The final part of this conversation to me though, aside from just having fun with your buddies on a podcast, and telling these stories is how much it allows you to, it, it, I'll take it a different way. The final part of the story is that you can never measure the impact that this depth of understanding and exploration and empathizing with other humans through experiences that you've had can have at some point that can never be measured in the future. I'm going to give you a very distinct example that's very front and center. I, I spoke at an event in Dallas last year. Okay. And I spoke at the event. And one of the things that I said at the event was that, you know, I'm thinking of maybe traditionally publishing my next book. I don't remember why I said it. It came up in conversation when I was on stage and there was a literary agent in the, in the audience. And she came up to me afterwards and said, you know, hi, my name's Jodry. I, 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 literary agent who represent books, you know, love to chat with you, you know, uh, 
follow your stuff for a little bit of time. I've been looking forward to meeting you. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that I came here was like to, to meet you, to chat with you. Um, and so, you know, that's, so we had a conversation. Right? And one of the things that you do when you're super awkward like me is you kind of have to create cheats for small talk because I'm just too awkward to have a real conversation, particularly at events where you don't know if you're going to be interrupted really quickly. And so one of the ways to do this is just all that you're trying to do in a conversation and small talk is try to find some kind of uncommon commonality or some commonality between you and that other person. And then you just go deeper in that thing. You're not trying to do too much. This is the first conversation. And so there's a bunch of questions there like, oh, you know, have you seen any good movies lately? Uh, where are you from? Like, oh, where's your family from? And and you gauge these things here. You know, do you like sports, music, whatever, right? You try to find something that you have in common that you can kind of like geek out on or go deeper. Of course, this is easier if you have a wider breadth of human experience to be able to do this because you're just, you can be interested in other people much easier and the more interested you are in other people, the more interesting you become to other people. And so, Jodri, I mean, you, like, you look at some people and you're like, yo, you're not from one place. <laughs> like, like, you're clearly a mix of something. And so I asked her where, you know, what's, what's her, I don't remember exactly what I said, like, what's your ethnicity? Like, where, like I'm curious, like, where's your family from? Right? And she said that her mom was from Hawaii. And so I said, oh, cool, like, like where from, where, where in Hawaii, right? Try to figure out if we have anything in common here. Oh, from, from Maui. I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's cool. Where about? She's like, oh, like, like Lahaina. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I lived in, in East Kanapali for a while. And I remember in Lahaina, they have this, this amazing banyan tree, this, 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 bon this banyan tree that basically is an entire block. It's one of the biggest trees in the world. It's the most incredible thing. Just time stops when you're underneath this tree. But in that tree, in that square, there's a plaza, and in that plaza, right tucked behind, there is the most wonderful bookstore. She's a literary agent, bookstore. Not too hard of a connection, right? I'm like, there's the most wonderful bookstore. It's called Friends of the Library. I'm like, I would go in there, and you just buy, like, old books that were deconditioned at the library for, like, 50 cents. She's like, she's like that was my mom's favorite store. We, she used to take me there all the time. Like, you can't, I, I mean, and now she's my literary agent. Right. <laughs> right. Like, you, I mean, how do you put two and two together there? Two and two doesn't equal four. It's not a straight path. I had no idea when I was living, finding myself in Maui, going to this tiny little wonderful bookstore, picking, you know, a Rollo May psychology in the human dilemma off of the shelf <laughs> or whatever other books I find there for 50 cents and reading them underneath this banyan tree that 12 years later, right. I would be talking to, you know, some incredible Manhattan literary agent who's going to represent me and, 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 and help me bring my work to a wider audience in the world. And a lot of the initial connection that we had was because of this little tiny bookstore that's probably not even there anymore that her mom took her to. You can't measure this stuff that really matters, can you? But that's what's special about it. Mm -hmm. I love it. When I was training, uh, Insurance agents a long time ago, seems like a lifetime ago now. I used to say, ask questions, make a, make a connection, go in that direction. That was sort of our, our mantra for, uh, for rapport. I also used an acronym form, which stood for family, occupation, recreation, me. Uh, you asked about their family. I'm sure where are you, where are you from? Where's your family from? Uh, that would go into your sisters and brothers. Are your parents, are your parents still living? Okay. That's interesting. That would go into occupation. So when you're not with your family, what do you do for work? And that would go into what, what do you do with your off time recreation? And in all those contexts, I would try to insert myself into, mm. you know, that, oh, I've got a brother and a sister. Oh, I grew up with a sister and brother. 
uh, what was that like? Were you the youngest? Ah, oh, sure was. Me too. I'm the youngest. So family, yeah. family, occupation, recreation, me, form. Uh, and that was a great way for me to warm. I still use it to this day on my enrollment calls. Right? It's just it's a, super powerful. Ask, ask questions, make a connection, go in that direction. Because you just, and I think we, and I know we got to go, but I think we all have the opportunity to do that. Even those of us who may be less traveled, I just think we don't inquire. Like, I don't think that we're all that distant in terms of experience from the next human. I th- like, like you said, I think we just, we generally don't ask the first question. I mean, right? what did you just demonstrate? Oh, you're the youngest. Oh, so am I. Hey, Lynn, guess what? I'm the youngest too. Right. Oh my God. High five. Yeah. <laughs> like, Who, who's like, the boss? Like, which one of your older siblings was the boss? Like, you just, you're just <laughs> going to have commonality. If you try yeah. to ask, it, it's it, and it's not even really a method. More so, is it's just what you always talk about, John. Just talking to a human, just talk to a person, right. be a right. person when you're talking to a person. <laughs> be a person when you're talking to a person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, this was fun. I thought it'd be fun to just tell a few stories today. They were great stories. We, we, uh, yeah, they're, they're they're fun. We got I got more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I got more. I got more. Uh, if you're looking for another podcast to listen to right now, I want to make a recommendation. Just scroll back in your podcast feed and uh, you'll probably enjoy episode 85 of this podcast, The Obvious Choice. It's called Guaranteeing Your Good Luck. Hmm. Good luck doesn't just happen. I mean, I, I think number one, I think that we we generally underestimate the impact that luck has in our world. I just think we all naturally do that. I think luck plays a much bigger part than any of us really think. But I do think that there is a way to guarantee good luck over time. Not in the short term, but guarantee it over time. You kind of have to help your luck along. So if you want to learn more about that, if you want to learn more how to guarantee your good luck over time, make sure good things happen for you, what actions to take, what to execute on, then you're going to really enjoy and benefit from uh, episode 80 five called guaranteeing you good luck thank you for listening this was fun this is a fun one and i hope to talk to you soon is this me talking to you talk at you soon i feel like this is a conversation but it's kind of a weird type of conversation and it got awkward at the end john it's not one of your better closings no Mm -mm. no one day i will figure out how to start and end (laughs) this podcast in a way that we you are not good at that. Objectively, no. you're just not good at starting this podcast or stopping it. <laughs> <laughs> the middle's great, but that's not yeah. Yeah, that was that wasn't well, a gift that you were blessed with, John. Well, you got take big care. calves though, so you're even. It's cool. Thanks, Dad. <laughs>